You're listening to Big World Network. After the Firestorm, Episode 1, written and read by Arthur W. Johnson. The flames were out, the embers cooling, some their prized possessions had taken. Most had not but what they wore, and felt that they, their God, had forsaken. The household on South State Street awoke late the morning of the 10th of October in the year 1871. It had finally begun to rain the night before, which had helped extinguish the worst of the flames. It was still raining. Robin O'Flaherty and Clement Tallgrass felt the exhaustion from voluntarily fighting fires on numerous fronts for two days. As they made their way home for some much-needed rest, they saw the total devastation in the twilight. The city of Chicago lay in eerie ruins far more complete than either of them had seen in any city during the war between the states. Their minds were almost too numb to take in the destruction. The boys were fortunate in that there was usually a large kettle of water kept hot for one purpose or another, and it was still warm as they greeted the morning. They split the pot and turned on the tap to add a little cold water. There was none. The city's water supply had stopped when the burning roof of the pumping station had fallen in and wrecked the works. They took their shares of the hot water and went to their separate rooms to clean the smoke and soot grime from exposed skin before crawling between the sheets. Justine Tallgrass awoke as her husband tiptoed into the bedroom. Are you all right? She barely controlled the concern in her voice. She had been terrified he would perish in the inferno. The only reason she had dozed in the chair by the window at all was her own exhaustion from sitting up worrying about him as she watched the firestorm blow north and east the previous night. She had also been taking care of their infant daughter, Sarah. I'm fine, he muttered, tiptoeing over to her chair in an effort not to wake their daughter. I'm just a little tired. He kissed her fondly on the cheek. You always have been the master of understatement, she said in the darkness, and kissed him on his smoky earlobe, relieved to have him back. Clement stumbled warily to the bed and lay down, too tired to even remove his trousers. Warehouse, gone, he muttered as he drifted off. Across the hall, Robin thought about the loss of the warehouse and worried whether any of the fleet had been docked when the firestorm raged through. He didn't care as much about the crafts as he did their crews. He had seen ships' masts in flames on other parts of the river, their rigging and sails long since gone. He would find out if the crews were okay after he rested. There was only so much a person could do without restorative sleep. He would just close his eyes for a while, then later on he would. The faint traces of moonlight that occasionally filtered between the clouds, raindrops, and smoke did little to illuminate the eerie scene on the beach. People slept wherever they could find room. Fortunately, it was not yet cold, for few had blankets to cover themselves. It was bad enough that they were chilled from the drenching rain that had finally extinguished the worst of the flames. Most wondered where that rain had been before the fire. It would have prevented the conflagration by dampening the buildings. Smoke still wafted across the assembled masses occasionally, but not in the volumes it had earlier when the fire was at its fiercest. The rising heat wave from the inferno had lofted flaming planks through the air, tossing them onto buildings as well as fleeing masses of people below, spreading its insidious venom across the city more rapidly than any virus. The residents of the Garden City slept on the sands along the lakefront, if they were able to sleep at all. Michigan Avenue was but a few feet away, separating the beach from the line of fire-ravaged buildings. The edge of the water was only a few feet in the opposite direction, Not far offshore stretched the trestle bridge that brought the Illinois Central trains to the heart of the city from the south. The moonlight, when a patch peeked through the clouds, skimmed off the waves of the lake and slid under the trestle like a thief. A large gathering of people slept between the water's edge and the burnt-out white stockings baseball grounds. There wouldn't be any more baseball playing in Chicago that season. All the equipment had gone up in flames along with the bleacher seats in the clubhouse. The white stockings had done well their first season. In later years, people would confuse them with the White Sox, but they were the forerunners of those lovable cubbies. They would finish the season on the road with whatever equipment they could scrounge up or borrow as they went. They would win 19 games and lose 9, making them the second-place team in the National Association. They were pretty good for a brand-new team. Sadly, they would drop from sight until 1874 while Chicago rebuilt herself. 
Are you all right, mister? asked the young man in tattered attire as he leaned over and shook the older man's shoulder to awaken him. I'm sorry, the older man pushed himself up in the sand. Was I talking in my sleep? No, you were moaning and groaning something fierce, though, the young man said. The older man dusted sand from his hands and straightened his vest, then buttoned his coat. He took a moment to look up and down the shoreline at the sheer mass of humanity in the faint light. Finally, he cleared the sleep from his throat and looked the young man in the eye. I think I was having a nightmare about my old life. You know, the one that ended last night? He looked down the beach again, wiped the grit from his cheek with a sooty hand, snorted and laughed. I suppose we're all the same now, aren't we? What do you mean? the young man asked. Two days ago, I was a banker in this city. He waved his hand toward the ashes behind him. And what were you? I mucked out stables over near Randolph and Morgan. My point exactly, the banker said. I could tell by the smell. But tonight, you and I are equals, boy. You own as much in this world as I do. You have as many fine suits as I do. He shamelessly dusted off his coat and added, Well, maybe not quite. But you do follow my drift, don't you? Yes, I believe I do, the younger man replied. And you have as much opportunity as I to make a fortune from this point forward. I lost everything. My bank with all its money, my pension... Mrs. Mason, my wife died a month ago, so I'm alone. I own what I'm wearing and nothing more, as do you. That's not exactly true, is it? The young man asked. What do you mean? You own the land your bank and your mansion were on, don't you? That's true enough, I suppose. But what good are they with no prospects of an income? Oh, Mr. Mason, you're not fully awake yet, are you? The young man asked. Why, what do you mean? I mean that all these people, he said with a gesture to include the sleepers on the beach, have to have a place to sleep and food to eat and clothes to wear as they try to rebuild their lives. There's your prospect of an income, Mr. Mason. The older man stopped fidgeting with his finger stuck in the burnt hole in his lapel and stared at the younger man with the stunned silence before answering. He stuck out his hand. Call me Henry, and how did you get to be so wise in so short a time? younger man shrugged, but remained silent as he stared under the trestle across the waters of Lake Michigan. The banker gazed at his profile and silently thanked him for setting his wheels back on the tracks. I would like you to work for me as I rebuild, he said to the younger man, all thoughts of giving up gone from his mind. I would like to have a visionary like you in my employ. And what is your name? Jim Stone. And what makes you think I'm a visionary? That's a silly question. You just opened my eyes to the possibilities, and yet you can ask that question? Well, don't expect me to work miracles all the time, all right? But I will give you an honest day's labor for an honest day's wages. You can't ask for more than that, can you? Jim stuck out his hand to seal the deal. No, not by any means, the banker said as they finally shook hands. Several hundred yards down the beach, a young girl dressed in garments of the poor, with smudges on her face from the soot, rocked back and forth while cradling a bride-to-be in her arms. The bride still wore her wedding gown trimmed in fine taffeta and lace with extra holes in the taffeta that weren't there by design. The holes had blackened edges, lending in an unusual pattern. The gown had just received a final alteration when news of the rapidly advancing fire was shouted through the streets. She was separated from her wealthy mother and her sister as they raced from the shop on State Street. The intervening mob of people had so successfully severed their ties that she had no idea of their safety or her own whereabouts. She had broken into fearful tears and had been comforted by a total stranger. The girl had guided her to the lakefront to escape the approaching firestorm. Roaring flames and the walls crashing to the ground had added to her sense of terror. Having grown up in a wealthy neighborhood on the north side where the mansions were set well back from the streets, she was not accustomed to loud noises. She seldom entered the city and had only done so for the fitting. The seamstress had not been able to make the journey to her home, and the wedding was but a few days away. Like all the other people on the beach, they had stood out in the water where they occasionally doused the embers blown across them. The heat from the nearby blaze had kept them from becoming cold, but with the flames extinguished by rain, the chills were setting in on them. The rains had come and drenched them, and still they sat on the beach because there were no habitable buildings in sight. The young girl continued to rock her back and forth, sharing body heat against the damp chill. She shushed the bride, reassuring her from time to time that she would not abandon her. You should try to get some sleep, she had told the bride. We'll try to find your home when the sun comes up. What were you doing when the fire came? The bride timidly asked between hiccuping sobs. I had just delivered a fresh basket of eggs to one of the hotels. The young woman said, My mother and I keep chickens and we supply eggs for three hotels every day. She shook her head and looked over her shoulder at the truncated, blackened skyline. Leastways, we did supply them with eggs, she shook her head. It may be a while before they have need for any more. 
A quick tear of loss crept into the egg girl's eye, which she immediately wiped away. She worried about how her mother had fared in the fire down on DeCoven Street. They lived two doors down from the O'Leary's. They were all poor down in that area of the city, but they were proud people. They may not have had much, but they were self-sufficient and earned what they had rightfully. But she couldn't go home and abandon this helpless waif who was about to become a wife. She laughed as the irony crossed her mind, from waif to wife. And how did she expect to see to the needs of a husband? Heaven forbid that she should have children. Maybe it would be a better lesson in self-reliance if she did abandon her. But she had promised to stay by the bride's side, and she always kept her promises. What had she gotten herself into? Back down the beach, the banker said to the young man, What if I don't go back into the banking business? What do you mean? What if we start a brand new business? The young man covered his mouth with his palm, stifling a yawn. What did you have in mind? That's just the thing. I don't know. What is Chicago going to need the most? The young man stood and turned toward the blackened hulk that was the city, put his hand to his forehead in a comic gesture of shading his eyes, and said, Oh, I don't know. Everything, perhaps? Give an old man a hand up, will you? The banker said as he extended his. Let's take a walk now that the flames are gone. They ambled toward the garden city that was missing its flowers and chatted idly until they passed over Michigan Avenue and into the eerie beyond. They grew silent as the devastation became apparent at close hand without the heavy veil of smoke. The banker blew a long, low whistle. You weren't kidding about everything, were you? No, but I didn't realize it was this bad when I said that. The smoke kind of hid everything before. The landscape before them in the dim light of early morning was like every man's imagining of hell. There was not a complete building in sight. There were occasional facades, or partial facades, interspersed with brick columns or a window opening in a non-existent wall. There stood heaps of rubble as far as the eye could see. The boardwalks and plank streets were but ash and cinder. Marble. What did you say, the young man asked? Athens marble. That's what we're going to provide that the city will need. It doesn't burn. What is Athens marble? It isn't really marble. It's just called that. It is the type of limestone that's quarried 30 miles away in Joliet, Lamont. It's what the water tower and the waterworks are made of. Like I said, it doesn't burn. You may be onto something. I can get a substantial loan against the land where the bank and the residence stood. That should get us started. We'll use the land where the bank stood to stockpile it and resell it from there. Surely we can put up some sort of shanty to work from. I can manage the business and you can go out and sell the stone. How does that sound? From stable mucker to salesman overnight because of a fire. How lucky can a man get? As the watery sun skimmed across Lake Michigan under the trestle and into the eyes of those still on the beach, the two young ladies awoke from a fitful sleep. Let's see if we can get you home now that we can see our way, the egg girl said to the bride. They stood on shaky legs, cramped from sleeping in the elements, and turned toward Michigan Avenue and the... Where's the city? the bride asked as she started running up the beach. The egg girl followed and caught up with her as they reached Lake Michigan. Mama? the bride said under her breath with a choke in her voice as she cupped her hands in front of her mouth. The egg girl reached her in time to hear the last and put an arm around her shoulders as she said, It's all right. We'll find her. Oh, I do hope so, the bride said tearfully. Now tell me where you live so we can get you home. Our house is up on Hickory Street, a few blocks from the lake. As the two young women traveled north toward the main branch of the Chicago River, they saw nothing recognizable. When they reached the river, there was no bridge upon which to cross. Now what do we do? the bride asked. The egg girl realized that the bride was as useless in the daylight as she had been in the fearful dark of night and wondered how she was going to make a life for herself and a family. There, the egg girl pointed at a boat that had just pulled up to the south bank of the river and was disgorging passengers onto the charred pier. They boarded and got to the other side of the river, but when the owner of the boat asked for the fare, the bride denied having any money. The egg girl took out the earnings from the eggs she had recently sold and paid for both their fares. Thank you so much, the bride said. I've never had any money of my own. My mother will pay you back when we get home. Poor destitute rich girl. The egg girl truly felt sorry for the girl for having been brought up wrongly. Just a little longer and she could shed her responsibility of the helpless thing. They made their way fourteen blocks north of the river to what should have been Hickory Street to find nothing but total destruction in all directions. There were other people in the area also investigating the damage to their properties. The bride stood with her mouth hanging open, gaping at what wasn't there. Maybe it's closer to the lake, she finally suggested. The egg girl took her shoulders and turned her in that direction. Do you really believe that? Again, all she could see was havoc. 
The trees were blackened stumps, and what few man-made structures that were visible were all but gone. The bride sank into the ashes that had been the front lawn of her home and wept, shaking so hard that the ash around her rose into the air from the movement. I have to go now, the girl said. Don't leave me. I have to. I need to find my own mother and make sure she's all right. But what am I to do? For once, figure it out for yourself. I'm sorry for your loss, but I have to worry about my own right now. The bride looked up at her as though she had been slapped. She saw the intent in the egg girl's expression and finally said, You're right. Thank you for staying with me as long as you did. You're welcome. Good luck, the egg girl said as she turned and walked away. She looked back a half a block away and saw that the bride still sat in the burnt grass, watching her walk out of her life. She felt sorry for it, but she had kept her promise and gotten her home. It was time she attended to her own world. Big World Network.